The writer we're about to meet has been a true inspiration to me and many others. His travel story from the unspoiled valleys of Central Asia to the grueling mountain passes of Southern America has shaped my idea of motorcycle travel more than I'd like to admit. I have been following his moto diary for years now and naturally I jumped at the opportunity when I learned that he will be traveling through my home country of Latvia and of course welcome him to Alduro Meet the Rider series. Ladies and gents, meet Pedro Mota. Well, Pedro, Eagles. it's 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 such a such a great pleasure to see you again for the second We're time. We're back again for <laughs> for round two. For round two. Well, for those of you who don't know, we are doing this the second time. The first time we did it in total darkness. It was a perfect conversation. He didn't like it. And for the dedicated ones, you will have it, but only on audio because the video was just unusable. So we're doing a controlled session this time. But this time, I'm actually a little more prepared. I have some questions are those, are those and I questions? have a plan. Have you? So, <laughs> <laughs> I've memorized them, so maybe I will not open the sheet. But right. anyway, you're watching Oduro, and this is Meet the Rider. And I have a great, great pleasure to introduce Pedro Mota to you. And I have to say, I have been following you for about five years. And even though I'm 44 years old, I started motorcycling very late. And initially, everyone was telling me, you should always go with the buddy. You should always go with the buddy. It's dangerous. Right. It's just too dangerous. And I'm, of course, going on YouTube and watching all the guys. And you're one of those guys that I see, but this guy is doing it by himself. This guy is doing it by himself with a heavy motorcycle. I mean, you had you had these metal panniers right. on. Exactly. You, you had a top box. You had like a tool bar on the side, like a tool tube. Home, homemade in Iran. <laughs> and, then, and then you had a spare tire also. Yeah. I mean, it's like, how, uh, how is that possible? And that guy is doing it just by himself, right? Yeah. So I thought, well, if this guy can do it, maybe I can do it too. So you've been a great inspiration to me. That's, uh, that's great to hear, mate. Yeah, and now I see you are on a different motorcycle and you're here in Latvia. And w where are the panniers? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, it's great to be here again. And uh, second, well, those Spaniards, they, they got a beating over the years, over the, the man of being alone out there, uh, falling, getting back, uh, back up. And uh, at one point I learned that um, actually not having panniers on there, or at least hard panniers, uh, is nicer when you're going off-road. It just leaves you with more options. And uh, I also ripped one clean off in Australia <laughs> when I was leaning into the corner too much and it came off this, this, this not even too big of a rock, but I was getting more and more comfortable with the off-road that I... Well, there's soft bags also, it's, it's an option. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I got to that point in Brazil. I started in Brazil, I got some really basic, <laughs> basic ones because uh, I, I spent uh, money on a new, uh, nice big, I like a big top box. Mm -hmm. I'm a big top box fan. Um, so I didn't uh, have much left for the for the side panniers, but those were soft. And then on a beach in Brazil, the first time <laughs> I went down with it in the sand, they just ripped. They just yeah. one side ripped off. Yeah. Have you Easy. ever felt kind of like in danger with that metal pannier? Yeah, I mean, yeah, getting yeah, your yeah, leg yeah. underneath oh, there. I, maybe? I, <laughs> I've had varying de varying degrees of the smack, and yeah. all for, yeah, riders who ride panniers off road will be familiar with that. Or just generally, if you make an emergency correction. Mm -hmm. You do learn to put your foot <laughs> further forward. <laughs> yeah. But one time in Tajikistan, and it was just such a basic situation where you wouldn't expect anything to go wrong in the morning. And you're taking it slow around the corner, riding away from camp. And I just so happened to put my foot in front of a rock about this size. Mm -hmm. And I'm still rolling forward before I can stop it. I feel the pan, you're pushing my leg, and then I press the brakes. Yeah. And then I realized, oh man, I felt I was feeling the pressure between the foot stuck between a rock mm -hmm. and a pannier. And I was like, yeah, oh, that must have been painful. So yeah. that's how it. Yeah. So that's yeah. also how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but anyway, but it, it does seem that your travel has changed over the years. I remember, yeah. like this lone guy, you know, like the overgrown beard out there in the in the Pamir Highway, beating the rocks and just by himself, you know, all this hard, hard adventure. And now I see you're kind of like chill. You're finding time to. I mean, tent is not here. Yeah. You, you have a friend with you. Yeah. Good company. Uh, you know, a, a good company, staying in nice places, enjoying yeah. the cities. You know, 
exercising, going out for training also. So has travel changed for you? It's Are you a, getting older, man? It's, 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 <laughs> oh, it's, uh, like I said, it's over, man. It's civilian life from here on. From or is here it just on, Europe? From here on in. It, it, it also has to do something with Europe. Uh, the training thing is a balance thing. I've done riding for so many years and uh, at cer certain points when I would stop, then I would train. Sometimes I was dying to train. Like when I was at the end of Japan, I trained in, in Australia and then I rode around Australia and New Zealand. Then I trained again in New Zealand. And then with the Rona, well, uh, there's heaps of people uh, along with me uh, who let go and, and couldn't really train for a while. So for me, it was balance. So I've done heaps of riding, but for me, body is also very important and now I, I, I want to balance so uh, both of them uh, mostly we know you as a motor rider yeah is training also a big part of what you do like well no yeah body well, building people, people, what, people, what have a, people have asked uh, but uh, off-road riding is in itself an exercise so when you start out you know the first days and when you go on a trip you're really tired uh, it's even worse off-road mm -hmm. Um, but then you get used to it and uh, the more you're doing it, it becomes a training in itself, especially if the bike goes down every now and then and then you're deadlifting yeah. uh, the bike. But you can get fit from enduro, uh, yeah. enduro riding. Yeah, so I didn't have to do too uh, too much actually. Mm. Once you're on uh, once you're on the road, like it, in Bolivia. It, but it's just that something that you like to do, right? Or, yeah. or, or it, it, you do it to help the motorcycle riding, not necessarily. No, it's, no, right? it's more for myself. Mm. It's a bonus, though. People have said, "Oh, it sometimes it look, does look easier for you to lift up the bike, but it's you know it's still heavy, and you're still sometimes in awkward positions that force you can't really use force to uh, to its optimum." Um, but uh, no, it's it's more a personal thing. Bonus, the being able to handle the bike is is bonus. Yeah, and it comes in handy sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Well, l let's go further on this. I mean, this bike, yeah. it, it's not the heaviest of the bikes. I mean, you're going two up or with yeah. a pillion on this one. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people here, at least in the northern Europe, they say, oh, you need a leader bike if you want to go two people. You need at least a leader bike. You did like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Tajikistan, Mongolia, South America on a Transalp, yeah. on the Alp. Yeah. This one, Atlas, is also a, a an Alp, is 96, it? it's yeah. Or OG Alp is a 91. Is that enough? Atlas. It is, it's more than enough. Um, I, could do, I could do with less if, if I would get sim similar two-cylinder two power. Mm. Uh, I, I, I would even get a, an even yeah, lesser, uh, lesser bike. Now it's been really good and the moment I was convinced that it was good was in Mongolia. And it, there it just blew me away, this loaded up bike. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a hundred an hour, you know, once I finally got the hang of the sand. And, and the bike was just yeah. on the sand. Like yeah. it's, you know, on the highway, yeah, yeah. you can't go too fast in the mm -hmm. highway. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you're doing 110 yeah, no in Mongolia, mm -hmm. you know, and the bike is just, yeah. it's great. And that's that, uh, I reckon that two, uh, that two cylinder power, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that, that, that was really uh, nice. And uh, at the end of the day, it's still 210, 205 kilos, I think, wet more or less uh not including uh, not in including the gear but there are much heavier bikes but yeah. they're also much uh lighter lighter bikes i would be inclined nowadays to go even lighter if mm -hmm. i can though i do like the two the yeah. two cylinders yeah. for that smooth ride yeah and also maybe for maintenance intervals or well yeah that's yeah, yeah. Th that depends of course yeah uh reckon uh, with, with uh, what is it a klr or an x or a yama xt yeah. you you should be all right too yeah. uh, though if you'd get a, maybe some ktms and a husky then it becomes yeah. more exotic yeah. and more is it something demanding. actually by the choice that the, you, you chose a japanese motorcycle because for the world travel it kind of makes sense or guess or or what drove the choice was it an accident that it's a honda uh, yeah or but it was i don't know yeah pretty much like uh, yeah uh, like we discussed last time there were two when i started out 2010 got my license i wanted to buy bike I'm, i was a student mm -hmm. licenses in in holland are like around 1500 euros so go figure so for me it was like i'm going to get the, the, the one of the more cheaper bikes and there's two options in in, in holland a, a yamaha diversion a 600 or the honda transel mm -hmm. at least back then it was an affordable bike they're becoming more exotic it seems understandable um but for me then the choice was which bike can do anything? And yeah. I love the idea. I was, I would always joke. I want to be able to drive up a grassy wall, yeah. if, if, nece yeah. if, if so necessary. It's like a multi-tool bike. Yes, yeah. cross yeah. rivers. Yeah. I don't know if I was ever going to cross rivers, but uh, for me, 
the motorcycle, rep as for many people, represents yeah. freedom. So um, some people really love the racers and whatnot, and I can understand that. But for me, the idea of a bike that can go anywhere, that's, that's, the, most, that's the most beautiful thing. Yeah. That's a, what more does a man yeah. want? Right yeah. or need? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. So that happened. It was a combination of economics and uh, practicality. Mm. And then I only learned about how legendary actually this this bike uh, uh, was, being so close. You know, still in the shadow of the yeah. of the Africa Twin Big Brother. Yeah. But I only learned that like afterwards and how reliable they are and how forever they will go. Uh, yeah, it's an uh, enduro tractor, mm -hmm. but I only found out later. Yeah. Well, if, if I want to go back to this single traveler question, yeah. Um, I mean, I could understand that a guy like Poskit, that is, you know, aviation engineer that has a racing background that feels confident enough, I can, oh, shit. you know, I travel. Know I can travel engineer. solo by myself, you yeah. know. But then, then I found you, and I was looking at. You didn't have any. He didn't any know anything. Technical. You didn't know any. Have you changed? <laughs> did you change? A, did you change a tire before you went on the first world travel? Um, um, uh, to give you an idea, on the, my first ever trip, that so when I bought the bike, I got the license, bought the bike, all in a time span of three months. Well, uh, license took a while, but anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I got the bike, and within three months we were on the road to Istanbul yeah, yeah. and back. Yeah. Well, on the. So it's, it's four and a half thousand kilometers, I think, to Istanbul. And then you come back. Well, the, the chain needs an adjustment. Yeah. Duh. So, 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 so we stop at so a mechanic. That was, your, that was your knowledge of bike maintenance? Yeah, it might need, it might need an adjustment. So we stop at this guy in, in Greece. Yeah. And it's this, this, this Greek dude, shirtless, because it's hot as hell in Greece, right? Yeah. We were, oh, it was brutal back then. And it's this guy in the blue overall. He's like, okay, adjust chain. Yeah, so you just yeah. sit on the bike, okay? And he's just, <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, he's doing this magic, man. It's, and, and it's like, but I'm paying attention. Yeah. And I, uh, he's loosening up the wheel nut mm -hmm. and, and then adjusting the rear. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, and I asked, so how much, how much is that? And he said, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and then something clicked there. Wait a second. This is so easy that the guy <laughs> is not even charging me. Charging, yeah. Yeah. So that, that inspired me uh, to. When was your first flat, by the way? My first flat. Yeah. Damn. I, I don't think anything happened. Or you have I'm never flat. had one. Don't tell no, me. No, 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 no. <laughs> After been, hundreds and thousands no, of kilometers. It's been bad. It's been bad sometimes, especially uh, Australia. No, yeah, Mongolia. Uh, May I can't tell you exactly anymore. It must have happened sometime after in, in Iran or after uh, Iran with more off road. Yeah. And then uh, when I got tough tubes, that certainly that certainly yeah. helped. But yeah. I have, yeah, I had some. Yeah, some tire changes in some horrible, horrible places mm -hmm. where the sun is just yeah. blasting down. Yeah. There's only sand around it. You know, once you take that wheel off, yeah. you want that hub to sit. It's greasy. You, you yeah, don't want to sit in the, sand. in the sand. And then you don't even care anymore. Yeah. Oh, gee. And you just start peeling mm -hmm. off the tire mm -hmm. with the levers. Mm -hmm. But all practice, right? Mm -hmm. But the first tire, that was Tajikistan when I put the Heidi's on. So okay. I brought the Heidi's okay. all the way from okay. Holland, the okay. K60s. I yeah. put them on. And of course, I punctured a tube. <laughs> so the next, m I was exhausted. I was, I was completely exhausted at the end of the day, demoralized. Next day, grabbed a taxi with my tire, mm. with the rear wheel. Okay. Well, that's a tough tire uh, to put on new. It's a very, it's a very firm tire. Well, and the levers. I still had those, the l two long ones with mm -hmm. a fat tip. Mm -hmm. And then one day I got in, in Australia, it was after working in Sydney, I was on the way again and I decided I need better le uh, le yeah. levers, levers. And uh, I got that one. What is what, those MX style that mm. have that little bend? Okay. A nice yeah, tiny yeah, flat so, tip. Yeah, yeah. And I never pinched a tube again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you don't carry them with you now, do you? No, uh, they're in Buenos Aires and yeah. Alp, who I uh, had to leave. So you behind. just trust that the civilization is going to take care of you, or right now? What do I? Yeah, I have different. I have. I haven't tried them yet, luckily. So. so, uh, so you have. You, you I do, do have. have you do have. E even though there's no panniers, you still have. I do have those tools, and yeah, I was reminded tools. of uh, of how important they are when I was, uh, you know, with Mariska on our first trip. I barely record anything. I didn't make a video out of mm -hmm. that went to the Dutch island Tessel yeah. and after the offslide dike in the north I got a flat yeah. and it was the inside tube rub rubbing into uh, uh, aluminum uh, aluminium corrosion in the mm -hmm. tire oh, which these are famous for yeah. so then you have to tape the, yeah. the wheel okay. the inside yeah. 
but I didn't have anything on me. And it made the day really complicated. Yeah. And it was on a Sunday too. So you oh. can't get anything <laughs> done. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't bring my happens. tools. And then I was reminded, inner tube, bring it. Yeah, every time. Yeah. Bring the spoons. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Well, it's, it seems like it's a testimony to you and also to the motorcycle, you know, going, going all, those, all those hundreds of thousands of kilometers. I, I, I don't think there is a continent you have not been to. Is there like Antarctic, Antarctica? Yeah, maybe? well, Antarctica is always, yeah. you can yeah. barely even get a motorcycle yeah. on there. Yeah. You can get on those research vessels. But I don't really have that mission to do. It just goes like on, on the field. How do you but decide where to go? Africa, I haven't done on the motorbike. Okay. Like, like, but what really. makes what, what drives the choice? How do you decide where you're going to oh, go? It's actually pr yeah, it's actually pretty random uh, at t uh, at times. So that first trip from Netherlands through parts of the Middle East, Central Asia, Mongolia, Russia, that was the idea, the initial plan to the mm -hmm. end of yeah, Russia, Vladivostok, and then you have to get out of Russia all of a sudden because your visa is expiring. But why? Why there? What, what drove you to I just saw, there? okay, so I'm going to do this trip. I'm in the Netherlands. Where am I going to go? Oh, Vladivostok. I think that's how a lot of trips... <laughs> as far as you can go. <laughs> I think that's how a lot of them start, started out. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and that's where I ended up. And then you're at the end and you think, okay, now I have to get out of here. Mm -hmm. So, okay, how do I get out of here the best? I don't want to put it on a cargo ship. There's a ferry to Japan? Oh, shit. And that's how you end up three months in Japan. Yeah. And after that, it's, uh, it's okay, I'm flat broke. Mm -hmm. What do I do now? Um, I'll go back to Australia, but this time I have a motorbike and mm -hmm. I'll go work there and then also get to ride around Australia. So then you become you unbroke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Australia is, is, is good for that. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, when you ride around, you pretty much go broke again. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, I'll go to New Zealand. I was going to Canada, but because of the big crash I had in, in Northern Australia, uh, where I broke my hand, mm -hmm. like uh, my uh, fifth metacarpal here, and the bike was damaged, took three months to recover. I was going to Canada, had everything lined up, but the visa was already arranged like a year before, almost a year. So you have a time to validate. You have one year to activate it. And that option was gone. So no Canada how things could have been. It, that's the big if. If Canada's uh, life would have been completely different, mm -hmm. but so it goes. But then uh, for me, it was, what can I do now? I go to New Zealand because I chase, there's, there's, I think, a big part of the answer. I chase, uh, back then I chased the working holiday visas. Those okay. are long stay visas that uh, allow you to stay in a country for a year. Yeah. Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Uh, it's a reciprocal thing countries have, some countries. And so you get to work. You're allowed to work, so that's perfect. You get to so stay this, long. So this is and work. how you make that happen. You, yeah. you just switch between travel and work. Yeah. And maybe this is also how you can actually endure it for so many years, because there's a lot of people that just, that's just rough. It's too tough. They quit. Yeah. And you keep going, keep going, keep going. It yeah. helps if you find uh, if you find the opportunities. Yeah. And of course, when I ended up uh, then in South America, and I missed out on some uh, money because of some rule, government rule changes mm -hmm. in regards to the pensions in Australia. They pay you out. And I just left that there. And then I got a lot less money. So I ended up in New Zealand. No, in, in, in Chile after a big motorcycle project on Alp. Uh, barely That's when money. it became red? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. all I spent all the money on a motorcycle project. That was... It was my first big project, and I didn't know yet that once you start a <laughs> motorcycle rebuild, all your money disappears into that. So I end up there, and uh, well, you don't make you don't make a lot in mm -hmm. in, in Chile, uh, and and that's still one of the highest earning countries yeah, in, South, in America. South America. And I already dabbled a bit in in, in YouTube, and there I decided, okay, let's get this YouTube uh, thing going, because I was kind of done with going boom bust. Mm -hmm. in doing construction work, cash in hand, cashy jobs, painting, demolition, all sorts of things uh, to keep the cash flow going, working in warehouses. But every time you go boom, bust, boom, bust. And, but work experience, not that I care too much about that, uh, but it wasn't leaving me any, with anything worthwhile I I except only in the experience yeah. department. So that YouTube thing then switching to that was also, hey, if this is mine, if I grow that, I get to do what I love um, and if I can slowly build it up to also make an income with that, that would be great. And but that will be enough? there in five years, but ten years if all goes well, it, and that's it, mine. Is it enough now? Is it, does it provide yeah, enough? Yeah, it's, it, 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 because it, I, I feel like YouTube, it's a rotten deal for content creators. It can <laughs> be, yeah, it can be ab absolutely rough. 
Uh, but for example, in, in Europe, that's still it's uh, it's still Europe is very expensive mm -hmm. to uh, to travel through. But it's a combination at the moment you do with uh, YouTube, and then you have people who really like uh, the the channel, and then they support yeah. on uh, on Patreon. Uh. Yeah. So go and support the guy on <laughs> Patreon. Do that now. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I, I, did. I did. It's <laughs> worth it. I mean, it, it's it's really worth it. I, especially, you know what I like about your channel is that you bring your personal experiences with you. It's like not only oh here's the place, this is how it looks like, ta ta bye bye. Right. I mean, you you travel inward. Yeah. You know, you you go through those places, but you travel inward, and that's why you seem to have interest in history a lot. Yeah. And I was wondering if, if that also is something that determines where you go, because you, you, you kind of want to know a little bit more about, you've read about it, how it happened in the past, yeah, well, and you want deeper understanding of yeah, it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, first first of all, this the whole experience is an inward experience uh, on, on a motorbike. It just amplifies everything. The motorbike just amplifies life. Uh, and then uh, this history has always been an interest uh, uh, of mine with certain books or uh certain games i used to play or once you go down some wikipedia or some obscure website rabbit hole you know uh, it's, it can be a lot of fun uh, to read and, and learn about places so sometimes you end up i had a bit of a roman vibe when i came yeah. from portugal yeah. well yeah. it's right there and rome is everywhere yeah in in western europe uh, all, all the way to the levant and in north africa it's interesting themes i was a little bit obsessed in the beginning with alexander the great so mm -hmm. when i was in iraq i was looking for a battlefield location uh, the, like, was it isis uh, or yeah. something like that uh, those are interesting things here in the baltics uh, i find that fascinating these countries here uh, stuck in between these emerging uh, superpowers of the of the 18th and 19th century uh, prussia used to be used to be around the corner here just this just barely out of the pagan phase nation yeah that yeah. became so hardcore. It was a Baltic nation. It was. That if yeah. it hadn't been for England and colonies. Yeah. You, know, you know, it's so funny. I mean, there's only two Baltic languages left, the Latvian and Lithuanian yeah, yeah. one. Yeah, and the North Prussian was the biggest one. And that's yeah. where all the Germans came from, you know. So Prussia ends yeah. up unifying Germany. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And well, we, we, we know uh, what, what, happ what happened there. And it was this Baltic nation that was really yeah. like pushing, pushing the envelope mm -hmm. in Europe all of, yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah, and this whole Hanseatic League of Trading. I only learned that because of a, like a game I used to play a lot, Europa Universalis. Uh -huh. And it shows you the, the, the world over the time span of 400, 500 years. And it's fantastic. And there is so, whoa, Lithuania used to be ma mm -hmm. massive. So I have all these places in my head. So sometimes I have like stories. Okay, so so, yeah. so you have some perception of the world How through, we used through to that, before. and now you're going and experiencing it in, in real yeah. life. When I'm in Uzbekistan, I'm, I'm all of a sudden, I, first, I drove by this place I get uh, in Uzbekistan. I get invited. It's some rural houses, some yeah. very poor family sleep there. They're showing me pictures. I see this statue. Whoa, that's a huge statue yeah. of a king sitting. Yeah. And I said, who is that? King Timur. Yeah. And I'm, what, of the Timurid yeah. Empire? Yeah, yeah Timurid, yeah. Timurid. Oh, they know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah, this yeah. post-Mongol, yeah. this great post, mm -hmm. uh, the greatest post-Mongol nation mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that existed. So I drove back to that city to get okay. with the statue yeah. and I climbed on it and yeah. it was fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, the, the history is always fascinating. Uh, fascinating. How and is it traveling here in the Baltics? I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem to be the most exotic of the destinations. I mean, especially if you've gone to Tajikistan and to Mongolia, yeah. and, and now you come here and you're staying here in Ietzava, a place that has nothing special about it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It has a nice park. It has a nice park and a river running through it. Yeah. But um, is it something, first, is, it, is first, it changing first what, of what all, you're looking for maybe? Mm, yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had a, sometimes I'm more off-road oriented, mm -hmm. but it's uh, not always uh, what I want to be uh, want to be doing. It, it also changes, again, it goes, goes back to your ch question, it changes based on uh, feeling. So sometimes I should be more pr uh, practical and just continue making videos if I go a certain direction. But I really got to feel it to go do it. And so people are asking, when are you going back to uh, Buenos Aires to continue riding mm -hmm. up South America? But you know, that was cut in half by uh, the uh, by the rona and had to uh, after spending time there i had to come back but that cut my five six seven year phase of non-stop being yeah. out there yeah. so that was a thing for me and all of a sudden that was gone and i know it's very easy to just go back but for me that was something mm. and that was like a cord that was severed so it's also a lot about a feeling but to, 
So you're starting you, something new with this, with the Poland well, and no, Baltics? Well, no, yeah, or? no, it's just, uh, no, not completely. It just, it just seemed, it just seemed interesting, an interesting uh, destination. What interested me a lot about this region, and a, a lot of times here people don't like to hear it, some people can get upset with that, is if you bring in like the, the Soviet time, because mm -hmm. people want to forget, yeah. uh, for, for, forget that. But uh, I think people like me come from a very neutral perspective. Because, okay, I was in Portugal and whatnot, and you had, uh, and, and, and Spain and France, you had Rome there, mm -hmm. yeah. there one day, but you never had the USSR, the whole thing, yeah. or being yeah. a satellite, say, yeah. well, the, yeah. the Baltics were really part of the USSR. So, seeing that old infrastructure interested me while I was in Central Asia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, yeah. really cool, even in Russia, really cool. So, you get a bit of that here, yes. like the, so uh, the, the Soviet blocks and whatnot. Uh, so, that's an interesting aspect. But I also start seeing the wooden houses completely mm -hmm. unrelated to that time. The old wooden houses like I would see in Russia, mm -hmm. you know, and then I get excited. She, like she, she knows when I start seeing that, like the, the older stuff, when I, the further away I feel from Europe and that always gets ruined when I stumble on a Lidl yeah. or, or a co-op yeah. in Estonia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I know we what were you on mean. The, like, we were on the edge of Estonia on the Russian side and we can't go there, which was for me was a major bummer because that's how I always imagined this trip. I would always I would go back to Russia, but as everybody knows, that's a bit complicated now. But I was at the end there. I see these apartment blocks again. The people are speaking Russian because it's a border place. Yeah. It's a border yeah. place. Everything. You went to Narva, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And a border place, you can feel it. It's always, it's always even before Narva already, it's, it's, dif it's different. And then you have these old blocks. And then right there, you look to your left, you have progress. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the typical European mall with the Lidl being built, yeah. the Expert, yeah. you have the yeah. Expert store, you mm -hmm. used to have that in Holland, all these familiar buildings. And, and I got to that point, and it, for me it was, that's what, not what I'm looking, yeah. and that's not what I'm looking for. And it's also one of the reasons that I'm not pushing for really to keep on going to Scandinavia, because mm -hmm. I'd still be in a European, Seems in a like Western the, country. The world is becoming smaller that's and smaller. I say, I say that yeah. every time. Yeah. yeah, more tarmac, every time you see a big highway built everywhere, yeah. I always speak to the camera, say, Get out there, people, because the world is only yeah. getting smaller yeah. and smaller with every, every kilometer of tarmac. I remember your Tajikistan video. You yeah. sent something along the lines that, you know, if you want to see this, come now because it's, it's, it's going to change. In Bolivia, I, I said, like in yeah. Bolivia, I said that because I already saw like the tour buses going yeah. like 50 kilometers on uh, unsealed road to this lake. And I'm like, uh, it was the border of Hito Cajones, this 5,000 uh, meter altitude border from, uh, from Chile. In, in, in mid northern Chile into southern Bolivia. And I'm like, one day, man, there's going to be tour buses down here. Yeah, Trust me, yeah, come, go, yeah, go yeah, now. Yeah. Like, uh, I envy the guys uh, from the 60s, 70s. I even envy the guys from the 90s before that cell phone. And um, I don't know if, 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 if our generation will be as enviable yeah. uh, or maybe it will because they because they, yeah. they are so far ahead like yeah. that they go whoa they had they had they had gravel roads yeah you, you know yeah. My, my daughter my daughter cannot comprehend that we did not have a phone at home right. we had only black and white tv right. and the telephone was just outside you yeah. know it's just a pay phone that you used you didn't have a phone in home and yeah. you, even thinking about the cell phone you know on you so it's it's unimaginable and it's just one generation but I, I hear what you're saying about this you know world changing so much I, I remember traveling to Japan and seeing that you know some same materials and same kind of paint and same fonts start appearing and yeah and everything is just like I go there to experience a different culture. I mean, we Latvians, we often go, one of the most favorite destinations for us is Georgia. I was going to say. We like to, we like to yeah. go to Georgia. But the Georgians, we can see that Georgians are trying to become more Europeans to appease us. Yeah. But we want the authentic Georgia. You know, that's, we don't want the polished. We want to see the... That's the curse. I guess you're the same way coming here. You want to see the Soviet past. You know, you want yeah, to one, experience one some of One it. aspect, yeah. uh, like, I, I love to see, uh, I got to see, also the Baltic version. Yeah. Uh, the, it's, what did it's you see? What what in, did you see? Any installations? Any military objects or something? Oh yeah, we on the way through uh, northern uh, Latvia. We we stopped by the nuclear missile base. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, oh in Yetseva nearby, when we left to Estonia here, there was a, a, a missile base. We yeah. popped by uh, the bunkers, yeah. checking out the bunkers. So that so that's all cool. The further east you go, the more remnants and relics you see yeah. of the of that time, Soviet or the Eastern Front. You know. Yeah. What well, something that 
that really interests me, uh, find interesting is I, I, I see these beautiful fields here, you know, and in some parts, sometimes like you can't imagine that this was uh, the theater of one of the most yeah. brutal bloodshed yeah. in, in, in history before the after the Mongol times, let's say yeah. that. Yeah, after yeah. the Mongolian times with that Eastern Front, you can't imagine just the peaceful fields that you have here with no fences around in the Baltics. Mm -hmm. The farms don't have fences around, so it is all very natural flow. It's it's a, it's 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 a it's a beautiful thing, but uh, when you touch about what you touch upon what you say about uh, Georgia, at the end of the day, that's that uh, double-edged sword of the uh, of the of the progress yeah. that's 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 being made, and uh, it does make the world is it, less interesting. And is it progress? Well, I mean, for them, in, in financial way, yes, but it, yeah. it, it, how it, you measure it, 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 it? At the end of the day, for 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 a lot of people, uh, it is, and maybe they haven't learned the, the pitfalls yet that that we experience, and sometimes our way of speaking about these things, we even have to look like real life. People from parts of Western Europe sometimes have to look back at their uh, at themselves when they're glorifying this mm -hmm. this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's easy for you to speak. Yeah. You already, huh? yeah, you got you got that you of got course. that you got that foot. But that's what that's what I liked uh, uh, about what I was doing, that type of travel before is like I let go of that foot. Mm -hmm. I was I like I, I really went away and went I went out there and I stayed with families. Um, I stayed with a, a lot of people. I, I worked in places. Sometimes I, I, I suffered similar experiences, like half year of lockdown in Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. which was initially in the first year the most uh, top three, most brutal lockdown in the world. So you share uh, those ex uh, the, uh, those experiences. That then again does yeah. make things interesting. So it, it sounds as if the motorcycle travel is time travel for you. It brings you to, oh, it is. to old, it is. old times. Like you yeah. can experience things yeah. uh, if you were a tourist on a tourist bus or even in a car, you cannot experience it. Well, anymore. if you if you ask me, if you ask me, uh, like what what is it? What is it at times? Like I can go, I can go to Scandinavia. I can I can do the the, the, the North Cape a bit, uh, but I I know it's going to be beautiful. Um, uh, but I've seen that sort of landscapes uh, uh, before. Um, but it was going to be lacking a bit of that feeling of being out there. And I think I'm ready again just to have that feeling of being out there. I couldn't go to Kaliningrad. That was so interesting. Also used to be part of Prussia. Yeah. You know, this little bit of Russia out there. I couldn't go to Murmansk. That was going to be kind of the spice of uh, this whole trip. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I found in the Baltics, when I'm on the edge, when I'm not in Riga, when I'm not in Tallinn, um, I can taste it. But I can't have more, uh, and that kind of yeah. This there, there's two me things. Out. You, there's two things in Latvia still you can actually see. One is this huge antenna by by Ventspils. It's Irbena. Yeah. It's a huge satellite that they used to monitor the conversations, the telephone conversations out of Sweden. It, yeah. So it's such a powerful satellite. You've got to know what the Swedes it, are up yeah, to. Yeah, huh? yeah. Well, not well, only yeah. Swedes, but it was also the Bornholm Island and the the Gotland Island, yeah. which is very kind of important place on the Baltic Sea. If you control that, you control the entire. Uh, right. uh, entire sea so they were picking up on the military conversations and everything so it was just basically listening device yeah a very very powerful big listening device over the sea now they use it for space research but you can yeah. still see it yeah, you can cool. go by it and you can actually look at it you yeah. know it's that's it's, it's an amazing thing uh, and the other thing uh, it's a little bit touristy now but they bring you down there it's an old bomb shelter for the Soviet party officials right it's in Liga the, yeah. it's yeah. not very far from here it's about an hour and 20 minutes drive from here you don't have to go through Riga to go there you can go the by byway around uh, Riga and they bring you down there I don't remember it's like seven eight floors down yeah. and you can actually see everything all phones and old you know installations and they feed yeah. you Soviet food from the Soviet you know aluminum bowls with those bendy aluminum forks and everything so it's a yeah. full spiel it's you can experience it's that it's interesting that uh, that's that sort of that sort of thing right and uh, but for some it, yeah it, from the people there it reminds them yeah. too much about maybe harder times no, they want to, yeah now the, it's a tourist attraction yeah. you know for us it's like oh yeah ha 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 you can go and look at it you know yes for a lot of people it's like oh we don't want to associate with it but i think i, I think that wound 
has healed somewhat. Yeah, for the younger generation, that doesn't really care that much. I, I'd imagine, like I'm, I'm speaking freely here. Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you say? Not, uh, I can't be 100 percent sure, but right. I imagine that S something similar. Once you go to the Balkans, once you go to Serbia, mm -hmm. you know, the youth doesn't really care. That they didn't seem to care much about what happened in, mm -hmm. in the past, and it's sort of the older generation that yeah. still really, that still really uh, feel it. But yeah, the first time I saw that in, in Georgia and Armenia, it was fascinating, especially mm. when it's abandoned. I like mm. the abandoned part mm. too, mm. you know? Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's really cool. That's gonna be gone one day yeah. too. Yeah. I wonder what they're well, gonna be looking they'll, at they'll in the future. It, they'll keep it as a museum. They're nice and polished up and maintained, but not like real, like yeah. you would go in and you're looking at the, an abandoned Come installation. look while it's still know? abandoned, because one day <laughs> it won't be. It's yeah. like in, in, in Iraq, you had these, in northern Iraq, you had these nice waterfalls, but they built all these ugly fences yeah, around yeah, yeah, yeah. it and these kiosks. All touristy with yeah, the tickets yeah, and yeah. everything and the smile. In Turkey, in Turkey, everything yeah. is, bring your, bring, if you're a student, that's the, the cheapest way to go see stuff yeah. in Turkey because Turkey has so many nice things, yeah. but you have to pay everywhere you go. Yeah, 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 you have to pay for yeah. stuff. So that's what's interesting about the further east you go, though until you get to Japan, mm -hmm. then it changes again. Mm -hmm. The further east you go, the weaker the rules become and yeah. the more free and the more malleable the experience is. And you really find out that th that the, the world is really malleable. Oh. And well, that East, that really, it draws me also. I, I feel a pull. I really yeah. want to go. That Tajikistan especially is the place I want to go. My grandfather was a crazy traveler. He was going very far East in the Soviet times. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, like, and I feel like I'm looking at these black and white pictures and he has this old Volga. You know, you know, it's, it's like... That would be cool. I don't know. It's, it's, it, you know, he had Volga, five people in it, driving over the d desert. And the fifth guy, it was a four family members, and the fifth guy was a geographist from the Latvian University. A guy yeah. who really knew the maps because yeah. the only way you could no traverse maps, no, go yeah. go go around you know across the desert was with somebody that actually could yeah. could find a way and then he has this picture in Samarkand you know this old Volga by Samarkand this, that yes, was close yeah, to that yeah, 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 there yeah. yeah but that's but that's truly am like amazing because you have that you know we're all too familiar with uh, the American dream and the American road trip yeah. but Imagine yeah, how the USSR yeah. road trip yeah, used to be. Christ. It was, it, it's, was it stretched all the way up to here, up yeah. until the Baltics. Yeah. Uh, well, George in a way, Armenia it was very cheap. China. Pedro. It was it was dirt yeah. cheap because you know all the prices were government regulated. Yes. The gas it just didn't cost anything. Yeah. But the problem was you couldn't get gas, so that was the yeah. first challenge, Bring right? The second challenge was where to get food because there was no Lidl's, there was no nope. food stores. You had to go basically the to the people. farmer and the knock on the door. That's what I've done. Yeah. Like in Tajikistan yeah. uh, uh, or, uh, or in Mongolia for, for fuel, sometimes I would play it so loose that I would say, okay, at one point, I don't have enough fuel on me, but I expect to encounter someone uh, in a car yeah. or at least a village with one or two houses yeah. where I, I assume that I should be able to get some fuel. So if and there's people, then there must be and you food. Know, things that they use, I've, I've, right? I've knocked on doors and say, hey, good morning. Um, Sausiska and eggs. Yeah. I forgot the Russian yeah. word yeah. they use for eggs. Yeah. But uh, yeah, then they cook me up uh, some breakfast yeah. and give them a coin. So yeah. that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's how it used yeah. to be. And uh, it's really Have you ever felt that it's dangerous? And, and uh, not only like to you physically that they could mug you and rob you, but, but just, you know, like if you travel India, you can see there there's these places where they, you know, put some donations to the gods or something because the travel just as further east you go, it becomes inherently dangerous. The roads yeah. are dangerous. Yeah. You can slip off. There can be a mudslide. Yeah, the mudslide. Yeah, or, you or you've never thought about it. You, you just do it. You see, you see traces. You see traces of that danger, but then you can't really think about it. Sometimes you stumble on that slide. Some. Like a, like in Bolivia, you're going around a corner yeah. and the slide it was I don't know when it happened, yeah. but it was it was uh, gone. And sometimes you're riding places and you imagine it would really suck if this wall came uh, came crashing down all of a sudden. Or you see all these yeah. perfect and there's rocks. no nets like in Switzerland protecting no, all No, nothing. Yeah, nothing. So if it's it starts rolling risk. in yeah. Tajikistan in the yeah. Bartang Valley, was like that. You look at some parts and it's like if it starts rolling, yeah. then it's and you're gone. It. But you can't yeah. think you can't think about that. It's like off with off roading. Uh, you know, you can't think about it going wrong because then it will go wrong. Uh, um, uh, especially with, yeah, if you do certain maneuvers, you always have to assume, okay, this is this 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 is going to go well. But most, yeah, the most real danger, people uh, usually, before, like you said, I, I was thinking, 
how am I going to do this alone, right? Yeah. They always assume the worst and they can't imagine all the best that's going to happen and all the best that's going to happen with people and just a very, 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 very tiny percentage of people is actually going to make things uh, worse for you. In the worst possible case, you can be really unlucky, but that's not, that's the norm. That's, that's just life that can happen in Paris, in Barcelona, in uh, Detroit. Um, but, uh, when you're, uh, but when you're riding, motorcyclists already have always that statistic above their head, right? Mm. It's like, oh, I can't believe you're, I, th this travel thing is one thing, but already people think that, are, that don't ride motorcycles, they think it's the most dangerous thing mm -hmm. ever. So you're ready, you always have that statistic above your head and you only amplify it out there. And there, yeah, there is, it, there, there is do some you craziness do you out there. Do you relate to that as a statistic or, so or like the sixth eye or something? I don't, or I don't, don't you feel like sometimes intuition? Because I, uh, we rode together. It's when one of our Oduro pals broke the hand. Yeah. And what, yeah. I, uh, what I noticed sometimes Get is... Get well, Rehurt. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> after the second surgery, man. Get keep back. going, keep going soon. It's for you. <laughs> oh, wait, he's not. No, 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 he's he, not dead. Jesus, no. no he'll no, be, he'll be all right. No, he'll be all right. But... Uh, what what I see is what what is happening when the guys are together on a short ride, you know, they take risks because they know that you know somebody will help me. Yeah. And, and, okay. Yeah. And when when you travel, especially when you travel solo for a long distance, first you you ride more conservatively. There is nobody to impress but yourself. Yeah. Right. You're like, why should I take that risk unnecessarily? That's that's thing one. The second is you somehow, and I feel that's what I meant with the sixth eye or just yeah. intuition, you start kind of predicting possibly dangerous situations yeah. and you kind of start avoiding them. You, you, you cannot put the finger on it and say, oh, yes, it's going to happen, but something feels fishy. I better slow down and yeah. yes, Cal it yeah. was a dangerous corner. It's, it's, it's it defi uh, definitely, first, first of all, you have uh, the, the calculator risks that you take and sometimes you know that you're being kind of stupid because there's some variables you can't fill, fill, fill in yet and you make some assumptions. Yeah. Um, like I had that in Mongolia when I was riding by this lake and I decided if I don't find anything uh, there was barely any ro uh, off-road off track there. If I don't find anything, I turn back at a certain point. But then I kept going back uh, past the fuel point. And then mm. for me, it was, okay, yeah. now I have to find a place. And I was doing it with very little water, like a liter and a half of water. And it wasn't smart, so I stayed close to, to, the, uh, to the lake. Eventually, I, got, I saw a yurt. Mm -hmm. I was lucky. And they took me to a place where there was fuel. And I rested in their house for an hour, gave me water. When I, before I entered the Bartang Valley, I had this feeling in, 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 my, stu in my stomach, like, oh, this is exciting. Yeah. But I got, I got, that's the feeling that really pulls me. Mm. So it's the history, it's that feeling yeah. that, that, uh, that, that pulls me. And sometimes there are, there, there are places, and it's usually based on experience. In the beginning, you don't know anything. But it's kind of based more and more on experience that you develop that sixth yeah, a sixth sense, and you gotta hope that you're all right with the universe. Let's say, uh, let's say that. That's what I was uh, going to to ask. You said, you know, I I was lucky, or so. Do you feel like, do you have a talisman, or do you feel like, sometimes is it something in your attitude, some positiveness or positive vibe that that kind of carries through, and you you kind of stay on the positive on the plus side. It's uh, because yeah. a lot of people, you know, you can read a lot of famous travels, the travelers they've been going, going, going mad until stop, and they just get killed or an accident happens, mm -hmm. and or they 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 get sick, and and you know it, it can be very very risky. Do you it, feel that there is something that protects you, or oh, yeah, yeah, sometimes my so, sometimes. Uh, there have been these moments or it's more people sometimes more people reminding me uh, uh, of that um, but like I mentioned with uh, with the universe before the only tangible thing that we yeah. can feel out that it's uh, in, in, in all this mass massiveness that we can't completely uh, uh, ex explain um, karm, karm, almost karma related but you know sometimes things happen or end up on the good side of things that you think like I must be doing something right uh to uh to deserve to deserve that 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 outcome outcome that can be when when uh, when 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 you're riding or have some issues or something happens and uh, and uh, and it turns out for the better or sometimes with people that you meet or uh, experiences that are so special that you think yeah like i must be doing something i must be doing something right to have 
um, have deserved that. Mm. So yeah, well, that's that's a little bit of like, like the semi spiritual element yeah. that we touched upon yeah. also uh, yeah. last time. That whole that, that whole spiritual aspect, I I hand out, I outsource to the universe. So sometimes mm. I comment on it. So yeah. I you have your yeah. You, you you you're like oh, cheers man or yeah. that's all right or you're in a negative, and you're maybe in a negative vibe or slant for some reason that day which motor you know long term motorcycling is ups and ups and downs, yeah. and you're like oh no I should forgive me I shouldn't I shouldn't be mm -hmm. shouldn't be mm -hmm. like this but, but but I think what I notice actually. It, Maybe it's not just your attitude, but it manifests in your attitude. You have a very kind of outspoken and positive approach to new situations it has and to new be people. Sold. Yeah, it has to be. And, yeah. and then, uh, because if you if you approach, uh, say you went to a village that is hostile, you know, yeah. with people, you know, that they are just, you know, maybe they are short on resources and they're very competitive and they never have enough and they see a foreigner coming yeah, as yeah. a threat and do you know that want to uh, okay. rip them off or something and or they see opportunity to rob the guy or some or whatever. So you have but to if go you with come with vibe, this yeah. approach, you know, that you are this lone vulnerable traveler. You know, you don't have a fancy bike, nor fancy yeah, setup and gear, or loads of cash. You know, you don't reek of cash when you approach them, and you you are like you know, like in your Bolivia. You know, you've been going through the roads, building the roads, and, and they see that you come totally yeah. exhausted. It's a, it's a classic the tale of the traveler. You know, and then yeah. the, the, the human side of any person, they see, oh, this guy is even worse off than I am. <laughs> Why don't I help the guy? It, so yeah. you bring out the humanity in everyone. Yeah, it, 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 it certainly helps. I think the people out there are naturally already. Uh, you don't even have to be that bust sometimes. Uh, people already naturally can have that tendency. Ironically, the further you go from the West, yeah. the more that is the case, oh, really? interestingly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so enough. even like we think those hostile countries over there in the East, like Iraq, yeah, yeah, Iran, yeah. And everything. It's like, when please you meet, come in. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's like please please come into our house please have some tea come be with us it's um, it's the interesting thing about uh, that's why that Vladivostok trip remains some of the most in interesting ri uh, riding because of the history the shift of cultures but also the shift of people and their faces mm -hmm. looking like us but not completely anymore but looking so looking so f uh, f f familiar but then also if you have you have like this middle line. If you, the further south of it you are, uh, in direction of Middle, mid, middle East, uh, the more people swarm around you mm -hmm. when you co go somewhere and invite you. And when you go north of that, that line, the more people, not necessarily, not colder, but the more uh -huh. they, they look. More suspiciously. No, yes. not suspiciously. More like, okay, so who's this? And then slowly they warm up, like Georgia was yeah, like that. The yeah. contrast was so massive for me because I just come from Turkey with the, or, or uh, Eastern Turkey with the Kurds uh, or Northern uh, Northern Iraq, and where they just swarm you, yeah, yeah. and and they want to know everything. And all of a sudden I was in, in Georgia and Armenia, and all yeah, of a sudden it's more coldness. Uh, ah. But still, those people they just as much they they take you in. Uh, they help you and I've been in some troublesome situations and th they come to you and that's the, the solo rider that's will we'll get to experience that to the max mm. already with two people it becomes yeah, a different, different story yeah. yeah there's nothing more uh, unique than that solo riding experience yeah. that you need to have just that complete disconnect yeah. and just be at the mercy of the elements of the universe of the people around you wherever you and end up there's nothing like it this is right. Right. cheers man cheers man well thank you for watching thank you for sticking by this is Petro Mota find him on all the social channels and YouTube and Instagram and do go to his Patreon I mean the guy deserves it cheers thanks Eagles my pleasure get better reshoots it was a pleasure man